I've got a festive message tonight. Since it is a festive season, I have a festive message. So go to the book of Haggai. It's only two chapters. So we'll do the whole thing. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Uh, the, the book of Haggai is a perfect example of how God can take a prophet and, um, and he can send a message to the prophet that has more than one fulfillment. Um, in, in the book of Haggai, you know, um, you know he's, he's uh, calling for the people to go back to the work on the temple you know, to build, to build the temple, the second temple. And, uh, you know, they were paneling their houses and making their own mansions, right? And, and Haggai was saying, hey, <laughs> you, you've sown much, but you reaped little, right? And that's chapter, chapter one, you know, and, and he says, you know, uh, you need to go back and build the Lord's house, right? And, of course, he was talking about a physical place, Right? And yet, at the same time, the book of Haggai is very prophetic for the end times, right? And he, he, it's just a perfect example of that, that, that there's another house that God's working on. And that happens to be you, right? Yeah. So, uh, but it, it's interesting, in, in the Amplified Bible, uh, you know, he, he details uh, in the little preface there, you know, uh, 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 all about uh, what they were doing at the time, and and you know, and he's calling these people to work, get back to work, right? But um, so he goes on down, and in in chapter two, he says, in the seventh month, on the twenty first day of the month, uh, in the second year of Darius king uh, of Persia came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, uh, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remainder of the people. Right? The remainder of the people. Now, like I said, this has more than one fulfillment. And the... the the fulfillment we're mostly going to talk about tonight is the fulfillment for us. He's talking to us. You're the remainder of the people, right? You're the remnant. That would be the remainder. Back then, uh, you know, some went into exile, some went to Jerusalem, some went to Egypt, some went to Babylon, right? So here's the remainder of the people. And... Um, and it's interesting, I looked up these names, of course, Zerubbabel means uh, out of Babylon, you know, out of the world, out of confusion. Uh, it comes from another word, to, to flow away from. Well, if you're in the spirit, you can flow away, right? Well, we, we flow away to um, accurate knowledge and, and insight and understanding and seeing the way God sees things and and not like the world sees things, right? So that's what Zerubbabel means. And see, that's you. You're coming out of Babylon, which is what we've been ministering for quite a long time now. Coming out of Babylon. And um, Shealtiel uh, means I have asked of God. Well, what does God tell us to do? What did Jesus tell us to do? Uh, seek and seek, keep on seeking and you shall find. Ask and keep on asking and it shall be open to you. Knock and keep on knocking, right? So that is the process. You know, it's the process of revelation knowledge revealed to us as a group and also to us personally in our everyday lives, right? That's how God builds his church through revelation, the Holy Spirit indwelling us we can ask him anything and and he'll give us understanding insight he'll reveal truth to us because the holy spirit has come to reveal all truth and on that the gates of hell does not prevail right doesn't have anything to do with church programs you know uh 
So anyway, there's that. And then um, Joshua, uh, of course, means Jehovah is salvation. Yeshua, right? Salvation. And Jehozadak means Jehovah is righteousness, which he's made unto us righteousness, but he's not going to rest until our imputed righteousness goes forth as a burning torch. And Judah means he shall be praised. So I think though that is very uh, insightful and appropriate for this message um, here and see you know he's calling them to build the temple well know you not that you're the temple of the living God you individually and us as a church and this is interesting because it's coming from the prophet Haggai okay and what does Haggai mean it means festal that's what his name means, festal. I told you I had a festal message for you. So with that, go to Hebrews chapter 12. I like hearing that hmm from the back of the room there. <laughs> there are some dots to connect, exactly. Because that's where we are. We're not in Babylon right? We're coming out of Babylon. We're flowing out of Babylon, right? And where are we going? We're going to Zion, right? We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a, a material mountain that can be touched, that is ablaze with fire, and to gloom and darkness and a raging storm. And to the blast of the trumpet and a voice whose words make the listeners beg that nothing more be said to them. For they could not bear the command that was given. Even if a wild animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. And in fact, so awful and terrifying was the phenomenal sight that Moses said, I'm terrified and trembling with fear, but rather you have come to Mount Zion, even the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless multitudes of angels in festal gathering. Right? That's what we've come to, to the uh, church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, and to God who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect, and to Jesus, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel. So we've come to Mount Zion, even the city of the living God, festal angels in festal gathering. And that's what Haggai's name meant. It meant festal. And what does festal mean? Well, it has to do with feasts, right? It has to do with a festival, right? I mean, it was, a, it was a great thing to go back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the wall, right? I mean, God was calling them to their future, right? That, that he hadn't cast them off, you know, that they weren't judged forever, right? Go back to Haggai. Hey, you want to keep your place there because we're going to go back to it all night because we're going to go through Haggai. So, who, uh, uh, who, yeah, to the remainder of the people, okay? Hello, Zerubbabel, and the remainder of the people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Remember those days? Remember our former glory? <laughs> Remember those times? And how do you see it now? Is, it, is, is not this in your sight as nothing compared to that? Yet, be strong and alert and courageous, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong and alert and courageous, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Hello, priests. 
And be strong, alert, and courageous, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. And of all times, this is not a time to not work. This isn't a time to rest, is it? This isn't a time to, to camp at the 70 Palms and take our ease and lay around on our inflated mattresses, right? Uh, this is a time to work. And, and what is our work? Our work is to believe. That's our work. Our work is to uh, bring forth the word as the Holy Spirit reveals it to us because uh, God has a lot to do. And, you know, we're only strong in the Lord when we're with him. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. This, is, this uh, actually book is actually very amazing. I, I, I have not really, I mean, we've heard lots of ministries on the book of Haggai, but when I got into it today, uh, it's just there's dot connections everywhere. And um, it, it's a very prophetic chapter, a very prophetic book. But in Haggai 6, verse 10, he says, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, verse 10, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with Him. Draw your strength from Him, that strength which His boundless might provides. You know, that's where we're strong. We're strong in Him. In ourselves, we're not strong. You know, we're weak in ourselves, but that's a good thing, actually. Uh, because, you know, when, when uh, Paul was caught up to the third heaven and he got the thorn in the flesh because of the exceedingly great revelation that God had given him, and he cried out and, and God says, my, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You know, because why? Because in our weakness, we turn to the Lord. And the Lord has everything we need. Everything. He has all wisdom, all knowledge, all strength, all healing, all understanding, everything we need. If we run to him, if we seek, ask, and knock, he's got the answer for us, right? So we're strong in him. So he's telling Haggai, be strong and be what? Alert. Well, alert. Go to Mark chapter 13. This is kind of preliminary, but... You know, this is good to know. This is, uh, we, we need to be encouraged by these, these words from the Lord. Uh, Mark 13. Is it hard? Is it too high? Or what should I do? Too high? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that sounds better already, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Uh, Mark 13, verse 33. So Jesus is telling, saying, Be on your guard, constantly alert, and watch and pray, for you don't know when the time will come. Right? It is like a man going on a journey, and when he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his particular task. And he gives orders to the doorkeeper to be constantly alert and on the watch. Therefore, watch. Be cautious and alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, the cock crowing, in the morning. Watch, I say, lest he comes suddenly and unexpectedly and finds you asleep. And what I say to you, I don't say to anybody else because y'all are special. No, he says, what I say to you, I say to everybody, everybody, watch, right? Give strict attention, be alert. You know, he's not asking us to do anything that he doesn't do. You know, when he, when he told uh, Jeremiah, look over there in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah chapter 1. You know, God doesn't, he, he's not asking you to do something that's impossible, and he's actually asking you to do something that he himself does. Hmm? 
in Jeremiah chapter 1. He says, uh, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch or a shoot of an almond tree. And uh, that's the emblem of alertness and activity. And then he said, the Lord said, You have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you what we should be alert and active and, and uh, on our guard about is uh, for, his, for his word, right? God's going to fulfill his word. And, you know, he's saying, well, you don't know the time, but if you're alert and you're active, you will know the time. You will. We already know the seasons. You know, we already have the, we already have the template. It's just what year is it going to be, right? And then when the day comes, exactly what hour? What hour it's going to be, right? But God watches over his word to perform it. And uh, be courageous. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 16. Be strong, alert, and courageous. That's pretty much what he told them uh, Joshua when they came out of Egypt after Moses had died. Uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16 verse 13. Yeah. This is Paul. He says, be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Uh, act like men and be courageous. Right? Even you women can act like men and be courageous. Even you women can be a man child. Right? Because he's called us to be like that. Strong is for lifting. A man child. Right? And we can lift over all the shield of faith, saving faith. Right? Praise the Lord. But this is what he's telling them. Go back to Haggai. Be strong, alert, and courageous. And in these times, you know what? We're going to have to be courageous. But thank God that he provides that for us. I mean, have you ever seen anything like this mess that's happening now? No. Wow. Total lawlessness. Lawlessness from people who are supposed to be... You, they're all lawyers. They're all lawyers up there in Washington, and they're the most lawless people there are, right? It's just they wear fancy suits and drive fancy cars and live in fancy houses. Of course, they're not when they first get there, just, right? Then all of a sudden, they're all millionaires. I wonder how that happens, right? <laughs> well, you know, if, if you don't stop lobbying, that's just the way it's going to be. It's all less kickbacks and bribes under the table. And they're never going to stop it, just like they're never going to get on the same health care plan you're on. They're never going to get on the same retirement plan that you're on because those plans are crummy. they got great plans, right? And so those people are never motivated to do better or work for you. Why should they? It's, it's all self-interest. And just the corruption just gets worse and worse. Right? So, be strong, alert, and courageous, O Zerubbabel, and be strong, alert, and courageous, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, alert, and courageous, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Man, that's the best of news of all of it, is he is with us. You know, it's God's plan. It's his idea. It's his way. And he's called us to it. I mean, thank God we didn't go my way or somebody else's way. No, we're going. Jesus said, I am the way. We're going to go with him, right? We follow the lamb wherever he goes. 
And he says, according to the promise that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit stands in the bides in the midst of you. Fear not. And God would say to you tonight, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of the world, when you made Jesus Lord of your life, right? Uh, he says, my spirit stands and abides in the midst of you. It still does, right? Of course. Fear not. Fear not. When God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, has he? Has he? No, he's sound mind and self-control, right? So, uh, let's see, where do we go from here? For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, wow, how many years ago was that? Let's see, I think it was 539 B.C., so 2,500 years ago. He said, in a little while, right, just 2,500 years. 1,000 years is one day. Right, just a blip. Right, it's two days ago, two and a half days ago, right? In a little while, I will shake and make tremble the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. Wow. Wow. Well, that's what's coming, right? You know, the, the powers that be that we see today... And, and, you know, we, we talk about America, but, I mean, it's, it's worldwide. But we live here, and so we see it firsthand. Or we see what we think we see anyway. You know, you really have to go to the Holy Spirit these days because the news media, is there's no real journalism anymore. It's all a narrative uh, by the parties. And, you know, it's looking more and more like the uh, wings of the eagle are being plucked. Um, that's becoming pretty evident. And um, we shall see how that shakes out, what that really looks like, right? Um, and uh, in, the, in the coming days, and I don't think it's going to be long. I think right now the wings of the eagle, the eagle's wings are being plucked. In Daniel 7 verse 4. But, uh, it, you know, in this time, even when the Antichrist begins to rule, he only rules for 42 months, three and a half years. That's less than a term of a, of a president of the United States. He only rules for, for, for 42 months. I mean, God's got a plan. He's just not going to let it go on forever. <clears throat> And so, and the beauty of it is, if we will listen, if we will respond correctly, if, if instead of taking up arms and uh, doing it by the arm of the flesh, if we will do what God's prescription is to do prophetically in Scripture, God will have a place prepared for us. A retreat, it says. You know, a retreat isn't, a, isn't, an, a, it, it isn't an offense. And we as American patriots, you know, we're not retreat. That sounds like defeat. But that's not uh, the way God looks at it. You know, e e even when Jesus knew, he knew that the, the Pharisees were plotting to kill him. And so he was like, oh, well, I'm not going in that town then. I'm going to go someplace else. And he healed all these old other people over here, Right? It's like, oh, why didn't he get his disciples and get some billy clubs and go beat up them Pharisees? Probably a bunch of wimps anyway. Well, that's not how God does things. That's not how he does it. And, and Jesus listened to the Father, right? He didn't do anything. He said, I'm able to do nothing of myself. And so he retreated to another place. But he didn't finish. He didn't stop what God was doing. He, he healed a bunch of people over here. But God knows how to do that. And if we will take that prescription, God will get, have a retreat prepared for us where we're fed and kept safe. And not only that, he'll finish his plan for his body to where they're prepared without spot or blemish at his coming. And that is what we're looking forward to because God's not going to fix Babylon. He's not going to fix the world. 
He wants you to come out of it so he can fix you because when his son comes back, he wants you to rule with him. See, our destiny is not heaven. That is not our destiny. Most of the body of Christ believes our destiny is heaven, and it's not. He, the man child doesn't stay there, and even the woman, even those who are caught up at the seventh trumpet, right, at the end of the Antichrist reign, right, they're only there for 40 days, right? And then they come back with Jesus to rule and reign the earth. Our destiny is not heaven. It just isn't. Yeah, of course, to be out of the body, to be present with the Lord. If you die, there's no condemnation, right? But what our destiny, what our destiny, why do I say ours? Because God's given us the revelation of it. You know, he's got to have somebody that's going to rule and reign with him, right? And our destiny, destiny is not heaven. It's the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That's what he's called us to. And I look at that and go, you must be having me mixed up with somebody else, God. You got the wrong person. Because I'm not cut out for this. But, uh, you know, quite quickly he gets me to shut up and go, yeah, you're my uh, work of uh, art. You know, it's not up to you to do this. It's up to him. It's up to us to believe it. Right? That's what we got to do. Believe it. Right? I mean, look what he told Mary. <laughs> wow. And what did Mary say? According to your word, so be it unto me, God. Look what he told her. I mean, that was just impossible. Right? I'll read that a little later. But anyway, where was I? He, yeah, he's going to make tremble. Not only the heavens, uh, but the earth, the sea, and the dry land. So with that, go to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Did you write that song years ago? Or was that Judy Bartlett? Judy Bartlett. That was a, that was a beauty. I really like that song. God is our refuge. <laughs> right? I mean, man, okay, amen, we can go home. God is our refuge and strength, a very present and well-proved help in trouble. Well, man, do we see trouble, right? In tribulation, because that's what tribulation means, trouble. Tribulation began when Adam and Eve sinned. You do understand that. When did tribulation begin? Yeah, when you were born. <laughs> Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains be shaken in the midst of the seas, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling and tumult. Selah. Think about that. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her right early. The nations raged, the kingdoms tottered and were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Think about that one, right? Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations and wonders in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow into pieces and snaps the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Let be and be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I mean, wow. Right? He's with us. And we're with him. He's in us and we're in him. Right? And if we can just 
take his prescription and believe him to the end, we shall be saved to the uttermost. He is going to do it. I told you this was a festive, a festive uh, message, right? He's going to fill, fulfill his feast days. Well, there's your festival right there, right? First fruits and trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And a thousand years later, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, go to Isaiah chapter 2. Give a shake, make tremble the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. Wow. Shake all the nations. And the precious things shall come in. But Isaiah 2, verse 12. For there shall be a day of the Lord of hosts against all who are proud and haughty, against all who are lifted up, and they shall be brought low. The wrath of God will begin by coming down against all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up against all the oaks of Bashan, and after that against all the high mountains and all the hills that are lifted up, and against every high tower and every fenced wall, and against all the ships of Tarshish and all the picturesque, picturesque and desirable imagery. Sounds like Revelation 18, doesn't it? Right? Then the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low, and the Lord of alone shall be exalted in that day. The idols shall utterly pass away. Then shall um, the stricken, deprived of all that uh, which they have trusted, go into the caves of the rock, into the holes of the earth, from before the terror and the dread of the Lord, from before the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake mightily and terribly the earth. See, God isn't going to let it just keep going on and on and on. He sees. He sees what's happening. And, you know, he's not willing that any should perish. God is trying to save everybody. Does that mean everybody will be saved? No. But a lot of people will because when his judgments are in the earth and only when his judgments are in the earth will the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Right? God gets people to turn. He knows how to get people's attention. In that day, men shall cast away to the moles and to the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold. Right? Their pro football teams, right? And all the stuff which they made uh, for themselves to worship, to go in the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the ragged rocks from before the terror and dread of the Lord and from before the glory and his majesty when he arises to shake mightily and terribly the earth. Seek, cease to trust in weak man, frail man, in whose breath is in his nostrils. In what sense can he be counted as having intrinsic worth? Right? What about a wisp of vapor? Right? I mean, God is just not interested in men becoming wealthy it's just not that important to him you becoming like him is what he's interested in you know sorry about that prosperity message people but that's not what he's most interested in right does, does god want to prosper you of course he doesn't mind you having things as long as those things don't have you right and that's the thing it becomes idols in what we trust in and he's divorcing us from that. That we will be totally content and satisfied with him. Right? We've been through that many times. Isaiah 13. And you know, we hammer on that because the whole Bible is around that stuff. Everything is about the haughtiness of man being brought low and the rich and all that. And he just is, God is just not impressed. I mean, Jesus... What did Jesus do with the, the rich young ruler? He said he loved him. <laughs> he said Jesus loved him. 
with these words. Yeah, go sell all you have and get to the poor and come follow me. And the guy went away sad, right? But if he would have done that, he would have really been rich, right? And see, because we don't really know what real wealth is. Real wealth is knowing him. Isaiah 13, verse 11, and, and I, the Lord, will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their guilt and iniquity. I will cause the, arrogant of the pr arrogance of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible and the boasting of the violent and ruthless. Hey, they may be in Washington or they may be CEOs of uh, Fortune 500 corporations, but God says they're violent and ruthless, right? Oh, it's nothing personal. It's just business. Yeah, as they ruin everyone's lives by telling them they have to close their businesses because of a disease that kills uh, uh, less than 1% of the population. Hey, you've never seen anything like that in your entire life. That huge, huge manipulation of the, the planet of the earth. Planet of the earth. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Whatever. That's, that's what our granddaughter says. Whatever. She tells me, uh, Winnie tells me the other day, to, she, she says, Pops, I want you to draw this picture and I want you to use rainbow colors. Well, I wasn't using Roy G. Biv rainbow colors. And she goes, do you even know what a rainbow is, Pops? And, and she was like, ay, yay, yay. Every time I pick the wrong color, <laughs> she's like, ay, yay, yay. Well, it's the ones I liked. He says, I will make man more rare than fine gold and mankind scarcer than the pure gold of Ophir. Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth shall be shaken out of its place. And the wrath, at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Right? He's just not going to wink at all this stuff. You know? I mean, we look at it and we're like, oh man, Lord, how can these people just get away with this? Well, he's watching. He's watching. All right, go to Hebrews chapter uh, 12 again. I love the book of Hebrews. I love this Bible. I had a blast in the Word today. I mean, it's just amazing. The Word is amazing. It, it, it just... It connects perfectly, every bit of it from Genesis to Revelation. It just perfectly connects together. God's not an God, author of confusion. His word is perfectly connected. He is not confused. He knows what he's talking about. Right? We're flowing out of that confusion. Okay, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 26. Then... At Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he has given a promise, yet once more I will shake and make tremble not only the earth, but also the starry heavens. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates the final removal and transformation of all that can be shaken, that is, of that which has been created, in order that what cannot be shaken may remain and continue. Let us, therefore, receiving a kingdom with festal gathering, right, uh, that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken, offer to God pleasing service, acceptable worship and mo with modesty and pious care and godly fear and awe. For our God is indeed a consuming fire Right? See, if we, if we are in him, we're in his kingdom, and it can't be shaken. You're thinking, well, I'm on the earth. How can that be? Well, God is our refuge and our strength. He can do it. He can have us out there in the wilderness and have a pavilion over us. 
and keep us protected from all the judgment that's going on in the earth. And that's exactly what he's going to do because he said he's going to do it, right? And we, what we need to do is take that prescription. Do that. Do it his way. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble. Right? Go back to Haggai before we move on. I got to verse 7 and he says I will shake all nations and the desire and the precious things of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with splendor says the Lord the gold is mine the silver is mine says the Lord of hosts the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former glory says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace and prosperity. Well, praise God, right? Uh, go to Luke 21. Shake all the nations and the precious things shall come in. I know what's precious to me and I'm believing they're coming in. And I really believe that. They're coming in. Praise God. I know y'all's are too. Luke 21, 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. We've seen that. More to come. There will be tress, distress, trouble, and anguish of nations in bewilderment and perplexity. Right? Without resources, left wanting, embarrassed, in doubt, not knowing which way to turn, right? At the roaring of the tossing of the sea, right? The masses of the people, men swooning away and then expiring with fear and dread and apprehension and expectation of the things that are coming on the world. For the very powers of the heavens will be shaken and caused to totter. Let's look at that. The powers of the heavens shaken and caused to totter. Go to Isaiah 24. See, we're getting down to it now where, you know, Satan is the prince and the power of the air, the ruler of this present darkness. Him and his fallen angels and those things are going to be shaken. Cost to totter. Wow. We've got some exciting times ahead. Isaiah 24, 18. And he who flees at the noise of the terror will fall into a pit. And he who comes up out of the pit will be caught in the snare. See, that's why you go to the wilderness, so you don't find the pit. You don't fall into the pit in your panic, right? For the windows of heavens are opened and the foundations of the earth tremble and shake. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is rent asunder. The earth is shaken violently. The earth shall stagger like a drunken man and shall sway to and fro like a hammock. Its transgression shall lie heavily upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And in that day, the Lord of hosts will visit and punish the host of the high ones on high and the kings of the earth on the earth. See, it's just not, it's the kings of the earth on the earth, right? Natural people, but also the ones that are on high, the host, the, 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 the fallen ones on high. And when does he do that? He does it during his, his wrath. When Jesus comes back, when he returns, right? He takes, he takes dominion of the earth at the seventh trumpet and God pours his wrath out. Here Jesus comes back at the seventh bowl, right? During the time of Armageddon, right? And there's a huge earthquake at that time. 
And this is what he's talking about here. And they will be gathered together as prisoners or gathered in a pit or a dungeon. And they will be shut up in prison. And after many days, like a thousand years, they will be visited and punished. The moon will be confounded, the sun ashamed. Uh, when the Lord of hosts, who will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his elders will show forth his glory. Well, where's Mount Zion in Jerusalem? Here in the earth where he is, that you're a part of now already, right? Praise God. Joel chapter 3. Joel. <laughs> yeah, the first Joel. <laughs> I guess maybe that's how they say it, south of the border. The first Joel. <laughs> that's how Hap sings it. <laughs> Hap's that little Mexican. <laughs> I got a feeling Hap's getting a sombrero for Christmas from Tom. Oh, man. Tom does a good interpretation of Hap. Anyway. Get silly. Let's see. Joel chapter 3, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You know, we had somebody come out to the property the other day to, to look at doing some work. And, uh, you know, he drove up and he was like, wow, what in the world are y'all doing out here? <laughs> and... It was like the Lord just dumped a honey bucket on this guy. I mean, I just went to preaching this guy. And he was just like, I totally believe that, dude. <laughs> you know, we believe we're in the end times and we're coming out of Babylon. And, and so we looked the property over and did some surveying and what have you. And, and then we're walking back to the house and he goes, but really, man, what's fixing to happen <laughs> You know, well, we have multitudes in the valley of decision. People want to know what's fixing to happen. What, no one has ever seen anything like this in our lifetimes, anything like this. And people want to know, this is, wow, this is beyond the pale. What is going to happen? Because there are multitudes in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon have darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord will thunder and roar from Zion. Hello, Zion. And utter his voice from Jerusalem. That's you. He's going to do that. In you. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the children of Israel. Praise God. He's our refuge. He's our retreat. So shall you know and understand and realize that I'm Lord God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then shall Jerusalem be holy, and strangers and foreigners <clears throat> shall no more pass through it. Right? No more fakes. No more. You know, God's going God's to gonna bring uh, true faith and, and, uh, to the body of Christ. He's going to grow the body of Christ up. And he sure enough does this in the time of judgment. Haggai again if I tell you to go to Haggai 3 do not do it it's a trick this is a test if I see you going to Haggai 3 I know you haven't been there before uh, you know so he goes on down to you know uh talk about clean and unclean, right? You know, unholiness is infectious. That's why he says come out of the world, right? Touch not the unclean thing, right? Come out of Babylon. Because unholiness is, hey, just watch the news media. Have you ever gotten unho got unholy watching the news media? Oh yeah, you want to throw your shoe at it, right? You, 
probably say a few choice words to it. We won't say here tonight. And, you know, unholiness is infectious, right? But holiness isn't, right? You got to choose holiness. You got to choose it, right? Uh, so he, he goes on to say these things and then in verse 21 he says speak to Zerubbabel right governor of Judah saying I will shake the heavens and the earth I will in the distant future overthrow the throne of kings and I will destroy the strengths the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. He's going to overthrow. God's going to do this. He's going to overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and the strengths of the nations. Okay? Well, this is what you're saying. You know, Jesus said it. A nation divided against himself, itself, it cannot stand. And that's what you're seeing in America. America is divided against itself. Right? And a nation that Jesus said that. This is Jesus speaking, right? A nation divided against itself can't stand. So what is God's prescription? To come out of it. You belong to his nation. You belong to his kingdom, right? You're, he is your refuge, right? First and foremost, it doesn't mean don't be a good citizen. You can be a good citizen, no doubt about it. But... And he says, I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, the horses and their riders shall go down every one by the sword of his brother. Okay, go to Zechariah chapter 14. I mean, wow. Every one by the sword of his brother. Hmm. Kind of does, doesn't it? Zechariah chapter 14, uh, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the peoples that have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall corrode away in their sockets, and their tongues shall decay away in their mouth. Oh, that's got to be a nuclear weapon. Well, does it? When Jesus is standing on Mount Zion issuing decree, uh, that's more than a nuclear weapon, right? According to your sons, be it upon you, right? In that day there shall be great confusion, discomfiture, and panic among them from the Lord, and they shall seize each man, each his neighbor's hand, and the hand of the one shall be raised against the hand of the other. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of the nations round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel, in great abundance. And as that plague on men, so shall be the plague on horses and on the mule, on the camel, on the donkey, and all the livestock and beasts that may be in those camps. And everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. See, we're talking about the thousand-year reign here. The, the one, everyone who's left of the nation, so they're survivors. The earth doesn't end. The populations of the earth even don't end. He says he mer makes them more rare than fine gold, but still, there's people who survive and go on through the kingdom. And God ha is preparing a group of people who will be a part of the government along with Jesus that will rule the earth at that time, right? The increase of his government, there should be no end, right? End of peace. And it, it shall be that whosoever of the families of earth shall, shall not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them there shall be no rain. 
right? If the families of Egypt does not go up to Jerusalem, present themselves upon them, there shall be no rain, but there shall be a plague with which the Lord will smite the nations that go not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So you think God's not interested in the feast? Those are his appointments. He's very interested in keeping the feast. This shall be the consequent punishment of the sins of Egypt and the consequent punishment of the sins of all nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, so go back to Haggai. Chapter 2. I'm sure. Last verse, verse 23. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, will I take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel. Right? Hello, Zerubbabel. Right? And I will make you my signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. All right, well, is that Jesus? Well, yeah, that's Jesus. That's at least Jesus. But see, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, right? See, he wants to share his kingdom with his people. He's King of kings. There's more kings, right? He's Lord of lords. There's more lords. He wants you to be kings and lords, right? King of kings, Lord of lords. And he wants to make you his signet ring. Not just have a signet ring, he wants to make you his signet ring. Okay? Now, back in Exodus chapter 28, we'll briefly look at that just to give you an idea of the signet ring, right? I mean, I'm telling you, the new age that the world is, you know, purporting to you, that's fake. It's a counterfeit because a new age is coming when Jesus Christ comes back to rule the earth. He's going to government govern it with kings and lords under him, okay? And in uh, Exodus 28, uh, 11, you know, he's talking all about getting... You know, all this stuff ready for, for the, uh, the tabernacle and all that stuff. And in verse 11 he says, With the work of a stone engraver, like the engraving of a signet, you shall engrave two stones according to the names of the sons of Israel. You know, you shall set them in sockets, right? Okay, well, see, that's what these engravers did. They would take these stones and... Um, they would engrave the, the signet, the, the symbol of the king in it. And when they would send letters or whatever, you know, they would drip hot wax and the king would put his seal on it, right? That's, that's how they would do it. He would issue his decrees and he put the, his seal upon it. In, in Daniel chapter 6, look at that in Daniel, I think it's Daniel 6. It, it gives you an idea of how that, how that works. Of course, this was an earthly king and really a pagan king. But still, uh, see if I can find that. Yeah. You know, they're putting, they, they trapped Daniel, right? They got him into the lion's den. And, and this king liked Daniel. He didn't want that to happen. But these other lords, they manipulated this. And it says in, uh, uh, when they put him down there, in verse 17, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that there might be no change of purpose concerning Daniel. All right, they were issuing the decree. You know, Daniel, you're going into the lion's den. King sealed it, and even his lords sealed it. They had signet rings, okay? Um, 
So go to uh, Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 17. It says, He who is able to hear, let him listen and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the manna that is hidden, and I will give him a white stone which, uh, with a new name engraved on the stone which no one knows or understand except he who receives it. All right? Okay, so you have a white stone. You have an engraving on the stone, right? And you're the only one that knows what it means, right? But see, he's, that would be a symbol, but he has made you the signet. He's going to make you the signet. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I hope I have time for this because it's just too good. You do. Good. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Now, if the dispensation of death engraved in letters on stone was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of its brilliance, a glory that would, was to fade and pass away, why should not the dispensation of the Spirit be attended with much greater and more splendid glory? Right? The... Um, the, the final glory of the house is greater than the former glory. Well, why? Well, we're finding out here why, right? Uh, for if the service that condemns had glory, how infinitely more abounding in splendor of glory must be the service that makes righteous. Indeed, in view of this fact, what's one had splendor has come to have no splendor at all because of the overwhelming glory that exceeds and excels it. For if that which was but passing and fading away came with splendor, how much more must that which remains and is permanent abide in glory and splendor? Since we have such hope, we speak very freely and openly. Okay? The new covenant that God made with us is so much better. You know, the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. You know, go to Hebrews chapter 8, and we'll nail down that point. Hebrews 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been without defect, there would have been no room for another one. No attempt to institute another one. However, he finds fault with them. When he says, Behold, the days will come, says the Lord, when I will make and ratify a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you're grafted in. It will not be like the covenant that I made with the forefathers on the day when I grasped them by the hand to help and relieve them and to lead them from the land of Egypt. For they did not abide in my agreement with them. So I withdrew my favor and disregarded them. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will imprint my laws upon their minds, even upon their innermost thoughts and understanding, and engrave them upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people." See, he's engraving his signet upon you, upon your innermost being, upon your hearts, right? That's what he's doing for us. 1 John chapter 3. He's making you his signet ring.
1 John 3, verse 1. So you see what an incredible quality of love the Father has given us and bestowed on us that we should be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. And the reason the world does not know us, it does not know him. Beloved, we are even here and now God's children. It's not yet disclosed what we uh, shall be, but we know that when he comes and is manifested, we shall resemble and be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. See, Jesus is the signet ring, and he's making us signet rings. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Look, look at Luke 12 to give you an example of how that will function. Luke 12. Verse 1. In the meanwhile, when so many thousands of people had gathered that they were trampling on one another, Jesus commenced by saying primarily to his disciples, Be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be no known. Whatever you have spoken in the darkness shall be heard and listened to in the light. What you have whispered in people's ears and behind closed doors will be claimed, proclaimed on the housetops. And my friends, do not dread and be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. In verse 11, and when they bring you before the synagogues and magistrates and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you are to reply and what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour, in that moment, what you're to say. Because you're his signet ring. You'll make your decree because it's the Holy Spirit's decree. That was, that's what God has called us to. Um, go to Luke chapter 1. spoke to Mary and the Holy Spirit was speaking to her in Luke chapter 1 in verse 46 Mary said my soul magnifies and extols the Lord my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked upon the low station and humiliation of his handmaiden for behold from now on all generation will call me blessed for he who is almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy uh, is on those who fear him with godly reverence from generation to generation and age to age. He has shown strength and made might with his arm. He has scattered the proud and haughty and by the imagination and purpose and designs of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low decree. He has filled and satisfied the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty-handed. That's just the way it is. That's what God is doing in the earth. See, we haven't seen the total fulfillment of that yet. This is the, what's to come. The kings of the earth will be judged. The rich will be judged. All this stuff that's happening in America where we live now politically, this is all being fomented by the super rich of the earth. And God is bringing forth his judgments and he is our refuge. And he's preparing 
a body of people to rule and govern with him when all the dust settles and you will be his signet rings and you will judge as king as he is king of kings and lord of lords so father we thank you that you have given us these these exceedingly great revelation this understanding and father we ask that you continue to prepare us to um to be those those people that you've caused us called us to be that this is your plan your design your purpose even to the point where the the body of christ will teach a lesson to the uh the, the, the principalities and powers that are ruling the earth. So, Father, prepare your body. Continue to minister to us. We ask that you protect us through these holiday seasons in every way, that physically, emotionally, spiritually. Father, minister to us. Uh, cause us and remind us to run to you with anything that we have that's causing us to, to lose fellowship with you. And we just thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name.